So we've been in Jesus stories for a while now. We've done a lot of messages on Jesus stories. We've seen healings. We've seen miracles. We've seen casting out of demons that we've been talking about. We've done all of it. Pastor Eric brought a great word last week. Did he not? Talking about old demons in new days. And he talked about confessing and canceling, command, commit, and then commission. I want to talk about that commit a little bit. For me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I want to talk about that commit for a little bit. All right? So before we get going, let's pray. Father God, I give you all the glory. I give you all the praise because you're truly worthy of it all, Father God. I pray that you change us from the inside out today, Father. I pray your words are heard. Give us ears to hear what it is that you have for us, Father. Soften our hearts to hear your message, Father. Father, remove me from the stage. Do not let my words be heard, but only your words be heard. Have your will, have your way. Change and transform us, Father. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. So like I said, a lot about healings, a lot about miracles, a lot about casting out demons. I've preached about Jesus walking on water, Peter walking on water. I've talked about a blind man getting healed. I've talked about an ear being restored. I've talked about the 10 with leprosy being healed. I've titled those things word in action, the right focus. Um, I've titled it giving thanks, one on church hurt. Today is narrow is the gate. We're going to talk about narrow is the gate. And we're going to be looking at the story of the fig tree that we find in Matthew 21 and Mark 11. So let's read those verses here real quick. So Matthew 21, verse 18. Now in the early morning when he was returning to the city, he became hungry. Seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it, found nothing on it except leaves alone. And he said to it, no longer shall there ever be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. And Mark 11's account. It starts in verse 12. On the next day when they had left Bethany, he became hungry. Seeing from a distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. Now we're going to skip down to verse 20. This is right after he had went into the temple and he, he flipped tables because they had made his house a den of robbers. And they did not make it a house of prayer. So right after those scriptures in verse 20, it says, as they were passing by in the morning, so the next morning, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. And being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look. The fig tree that you cursed has withered. So like I talked about, we've talked about healings, miracles, casting out of demons. But all of Christ's miracles up until now that we've talked about were for the good of men. Right? For the good of men, women. It was for their good. It provided the power of his grace and his blessing. Even what Pastor Eric talked about last week, the casting out of the pigs into the demons, that was only but for permission at that point. All he did was to benefit or to comfort his friends. None was for terror, for punishment of his enemies. But now, at last, to show that all judgment is committed to him. That he not only has the power to save, but he also has the power to destroy. The power of his wrath with the curse. But it's important to notice, it wasn't on a man, it wasn't on a woman, it wasn't on a child, it wasn't on any human being at this point. It was on a fig tree. And why do we know that? Why do we know that no man, of course we see the fig tree, but why was it a fig tree? He had every opportunity to do this to a human being. But why not? Luke 4 tells us exactly why he had not done this yet. Luke 4, this is Jesus right after he was baptized. He was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. He was led into the wilderness where he was then tempted three times. He was fasting. He was praying. But he defeated the enemy by literally quoting scripture. 
what we see as part of the armor, the word of God, the sword that we have. And he defeated him. He came out of that in power, it says in verse 14. And then verse 18, we see this. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to captives, recovery to sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. What's important is he's he's quoting, he's reading out of Isaiah 61 right now. That is where he's reading. If you don't study, if you just read through your Bible, you're going to miss something. He's reading Isaiah 61, right after he says to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, it says he rolled up the scroll. He rolled up that scroll and he put it away. But where did he stop reading that? Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord anointed me to bring good news to the humble. He has set me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to captives, freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. This is where he rolled it up and the day of vengeance of our God. He rolled it up because that day had not come yet. He did not come to fulfill that day yet. He came as a sacrificial lamb at this time. Amen to that. Thank goodness that he came as that sacrificial lamb for each and every one of us at that point. But he's gonna come back as the lion. And when that day is, Revelation 16, one, then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go, pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the seven wrath of God. We still have time. We still have time to evangelize. We still have time to go out there to seek and save those which is lost. Be a part of him seeking and saving those which are lost. Amen? I don't know how much time we've got. As Pastor Eric talked about last week, I have no idea how much time. The world's getting crazier and crazier and crazier. But we have time. We have time to repent, turn away from the evil things that we have done not focusing on his house, as we're going to talk about here in a minute. So the message goes on, right? Remember, as this message goes on, take these words that I'm about to share, the stuff that the Lord's put on me as a, wor- as a warning, words of a warning to you, not as condemnation, not as a final judgment to you, not that you can't repent and turn back because the time hasn't come yet. He rolled up that scroll. But the next time he breaks that scroll open, He's coming back as a lion. And we can't wait for that time. Amen? All right, so Matthew 21, let's dissect this fig tree. How does this all relate? So in seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it, found nothing on it except leaves alone. And he said to it, no longer shall there ever be any fruit from you. This seems pretty harsh. If you read this on the level, you're just skimming through, you're like, He was hungry, he found a tree with no fruit and he just cursed this thing. It seems pretty, pretty harsh. But now you gotta read every account. I've told you multiple times, right? You can't just take one account of a story. You need to read everything, totality of scripture. Mark's account tells us something just a little bit different. Still says that he's hungry, but it says, seeing from a distance a fig tree in leaf. He went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. So Jesus is hungry. From a distance, he looks and he sees a fig tree and leaves. He goes over to it to look to see if it's got any fruit and still sees nothing, but it's not the season for it. Still seems pretty harsh, does it not? It's not even the season for this thing to have figs, and he's cursing it. It seems like Jesus was hungry, wanted food, didn't get it, and now he's hangry. (laughs) Who's been there? Who's been hangry? Stop looking at your wives. Right? Seems like he's hangry. To understand this story, you've got to understand figs. You've got to understand what this means and what the figs do and how they look. Right? You have to understand what that looks like for them over there. So this fig tree has leaves on it. Fig trees first develop this edible fruit. It's not the fig, it's just this edible fruit that it has on it. And then the leaves come in, and when the leaves come in, it should have fruit. Whether it be these edible first fruits aspect or actual figs 
should be on this tree. It's displaying everything that it should be, right? But it's producing no fruit. So it was given the appearance of a fig tree that should be bearing good fruit or fruit in general, but in all actuality, it was producing nothing. Who's ready to get some toes rolled over this morning? Right? You ready? You guys are quiet. You guys are quiet. Lord, help me. All right, let's start with this verse right here. Matthew 7. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and look, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Jesus truly did not like hypocrisy. You can see it with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Woe to you, you hypocrites. Can I tell you, he's truly dealt with me on this topic of taking the log out of my own eye when I go to talk about this next subject with you guys. And I share some of the things that he's been dealing with me. I've taken that log out. There's still sawdust inside there, though. All right, there's still stuff that he's working on, but I'm not coming to judge you. Like I said, he's not coming to judge you. This is a warning aspect. Amen? So remember what I said. It's a warning. How many of us, if we're honest, we look like the fig tree? We call ourselves devout Christians. We put our faith, hope, and trust into Jesus. We call him King of Kings, Lord of Lords. But in all reality, we're just as barren as the fig tree. We have no fruit. We're an imposter. We're faking it till we make it. It's real quiet in here. That's how I was too when I heard it. Real quiet. What do you mean, Mike? I'm here today. I'm at church. I'm here listening. I'm online listening. Yeah, but you're here today, but when you leave here, you're going to go back out and po- focus on things of this world, and you're in here to get your Jesus fix. But I come on Sunday and Wednesday, Mike. Yeah, and every other day you're in the world focusing on things of this world. You're here to get your Jesus fix. But my kids have school. I've got work I got to get to. It's late. I got things going on. Trust me. I get it. There's things that happen where you can't be every single place every time. What I'm saying is stop making excuses for discounting or denying or whatever you want to call it of the gathering of the saints. Of corporate warfare. Pastor told us we're not against flesh and blood. Our war is not against flesh and blood. And if we try and go out there alone, we're going to fail. Corporate warfare, coming together. The, the, the armor that we have is much better when we're linked arm in arm with someone else that has the armor on with us. It's ironing, sharpening iron. But Mike, I read 15 minutes a day. I pray. I mean, I even fast. I don't cuss. I don't drink. I'm a good guy. I'm a good girl. <laughs> but you don't give of your time, talents, or treasures You don't serve, you don't do any of that stuff. You don't evangelize, you're afraid at your workforce to share your faith because you might get called a Jesus freak. You don't wanna change the way that you're going even though you feel the Lord calling on you to do it because you don't wanna be labeled something different. But we call ourselves a Christian. And I mean some of us do it all. We pray, we tithe, we soak, we give, we do all these things. We go on missions. We, we go on missions locally. We go on missions overseas. We do all these things, but we're doing it for the wrong reason with the wrong heart. We do it because we think we have to. We do it because we're trying to get approval from man or woman. We don't do it because we're truly chasing after the king of kings. And I get it. Sanctification is real. And he works on each and every one of us in a different way. And he changes and transforms us from one part of glory to the next part of glory over and over and over. And he keeps doing it. The warning is stop using sanctification as a crutch. Stop using the word, well, the Lord's working on me in this area. I'll give you a story. 
I had the same aspect where I was always like, man, the Lord's working on me in my gentleness in traffic. <laughs> if you drive in Jacksonville, you know what I'm talking about. He's working on me in traffic. I used to always say that until he's like, I'm not working on you. You're just ignoring me. <laughs> right? You're just doing your own thing, focusing on things of this world and not of me. And I was getting mad with no appointment. Like I was going nowhere. I had no place to be at a certain time. I had no nothing. And I was getting mad at traffic. For what reason? Right? These are the things we have to worry about. These are the things that we got to focus on. This is why. And this is why I labeled it narrow is the gate. Matthew 7. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide. The way is broad that leads to destruction. There are many who enter through it. For the gate is narrow and the way is constricted that leads to life. There are few who find it. There are few who find it. If you take a poll in America, a lot of people call themselves Christian. But few will find that narrow gate. This is what it says. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You see people talk about this and they have a picture of a wolf. Spoiler alert, it looks like a sheep. It won't look like a wolf. The devil doesn't come to you with horns and a tail and a pitchfork. It's going to look like a sheep. But how do you know them? You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs through thris- from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down thrown into the fire, so then you will know them by their fruits. We're not talking about how many lives they've changed or transformed or led to salvation. We're not talking about how many people they disciple. We're not talking about how much money they give. We're not talking about how much time they serve. We're not talking about any of that stuff. What is the bad fruit? Galatians 5. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are sexual immorality, impurity, indecent behavior, idolatry, witchcraft, Magic, I don't care if it's made up or not. Witchcraft, hostilities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division. You see that a lot. Factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Broad is the way to destruction. Broad is the way to destruction. This world, you can see this. But listen, this is what it's about. When the Holy Spirit comes into you and you soak in him and you soak in his word and you're reading his word and you're soaking with him daily and you're spending time with him and he knows you on a personal level and you know him on a personal level, he fills you up and then the byproduct of all of that is the fruit. There's a fruit that's the byproduct. Something that you don't have to pray for, something that you don't have to keep, it's the byproduct. And what is this byproduct that we're talking about? It's the good fruit. Galatians 5 again, but the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That's the good fruit. That's the fruit that we're talking about. But the thing about it is, right, we can struggle. Remember, the fig tree was cursed because it had no fruit, not because it didn't have all of the fruit. Lord's still going to work on you in areas, right? The Lord's still going to work on you, but he's so good in each and every one of these areas. He's even gentle with us when we're going down a wrong path, and he's like, uh, nope, and I'm going to put you over here. Right? He changes our past and he's gentle with us. Sometimes we're not gentle when we're correcting our kids, our spouse. We're never gentle in that area. Right? He works on us in different areas of our life. I heard a story of a pastor that was trying to get a job somewhere and the church was interviewing them and they said, which way do you lean? Do you lean left or do you lean right? Because our church tends to lean to the left. And he said, I don't lean any way. I stand firm on the word of God, and that's where I stand. It's not about leaning left or right, because that's the wide is the destruction. Wide is the path that leads to destruction. 
Let me give you another example. What I mean by this. If I was to sit up here and I was to tell you, murder's okay. As long as it's your enemy, they're a bad guy, murder's all right. Or you're okay, you can lie as long as you're furthering the kingdom, don't worry about it. Little lie is not going to hurt anything. If I sat up here and told you sex before marriage is okay, it's all right, don't worry about it. Or it's okay, you can live with your significant other, your girlfriend, boyfriend, your fiance, you're going to get married anyways, go ahead, it's okay to do that. You would literally push me off the stage. You would roll me out the door. You wouldn't have me come up here and preach again. Pastor Adam may not have me come up here and preach after this message anyways. <laughs> but you wouldn't let me back up here. However, you'll leave here today and you'll go put on some music. You'll listen to some country songs or some R&B, some hip hop, some old school stuff. And you'll listen to it and you'll invite it into your car right after this. You'll go home, you'll put it on some movie, some TV show that you love, and you'll listen to it and you'll watch it and you'll invite it into your home like it's no big deal. But yet you won't let it here, but as soon as you leave here, you're okay with it. That's focusing on things of this world and not things of above. Trust me, it hit me just as hard. I'm no different than each and every one of you here. I'm just the unlucky guy that has to deliver this. So when you truly die to self... When you check your heart, when you ask, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Is this furthering the kingdom? Is it not furthering the kingdom? You need to look at 1 Corinthians 10. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, there's a caveat, do all things for the glory of God. Mike, you're being a party pooper. You're not letting me do stuff. You're telling me I can't have fun. You can have fun. I love to have fun. I love to play PlayStation with Ryan. We play a farming game. It sounds really boring, right? We actually have to like plow the ground and plant the, the seed and tend to the cows and there's pigs and we're going through the field at 10 miles an hour. It doesn't seem fun. It's not a fast paced thing, but it's fun for us. It's where we grew up, right? But if I'm neglecting my spiritual walk before I do this, then what's the point? If I'm neglecting his spiritual walk before I do it, what's the point? Why do we do the things that we do? I went to Top Golf this last week. I was standing on my other leg. I was swinging a golf club. It was awesome. It was only because of God that I was able to do that though. And I was able to share my testimony with a lady that was the waitress there for us and let her know like, hey, this was the last place I played golf six years ago. And now this is the first time I picked up a club again. And my dad was there both times. But it's only by the grace of God. That's bringing glory to God in everything that we do. So I'm not telling you you can't have fun. Just where is your focus? Sometimes we need to check ourselves, see what we're doing and why we're doing it. Did I start to focus on my own house? Did I start to focus on my own things? The book of Haggai tells us this. They had stopped focusing on the temple, rebuilding the temple. They started focusing on their own stuff, their own house, putting all the stuff into their house. And the Lord's telling them, like, look at you're eating and you cannot get satisfied. You're making money and you're putting it into a bag filled with holes. Who feels like that sometimes? You got a bag of holes where your money's going at because it's just going. This is what he tells them. The Lord of armies says this, consider your ways, go to the mountains, bring wood, rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with you and honor, says the Lord. You start an ambitious project, but behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home, I blow it away. Why, declares the Lord of armies, is because of my house, which remains desolate. While each of you runs to his own house, therefore, because of you, the sky has withheld its dew. The earth has withheld its produce. And I called for a drought on the land, on the mountains, on the grain, on the new wine, on the oil, on the ground, and on what the ground produces, on mankind, on cattle, and all the products of the labor of your hands. It wasn't a demon. A demon didn't do this. A demon wasn't in the fig tree. Demons are real. They're out there to kill, steal, and destroy. Sometimes it's not a demon that does it. The Lord withheld The Lord withheld this stuff from them as a correction, to refocus them, to bring them back to him. Because as we see in Revelation 2, it says this, 
This is to the church of Ephesus, the first letter that we see. But I have this against you that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember where you have fallen and repent. Repent. Do the deed you did at first or else I'm coming to you and I'll remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. That's scary. But like I told you, he rolled up the scroll before the day of vengeance, so it's not too late. It's not too late to repent. It's not too late to turn away from the things that we're doing and to start focusing on his house, playing a part in building his kingdom and stop worrying so much on our own. Stop focusing on the earthly desires and focus on heavenly desires. Amen. But Mike, all I got to do is believe. Stop talking to me about this stuff. I just have to, to believe. Confess and that's it. James 5 says this. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. There's more than just believing. And I'm not telling you a workspace theology. You can do all the works you want. You can follow all the law you want. It's not going to save you. But Jesus came to fulfill the law, not abolish the law. We're still called to do good works. It's just that we stop at Ephesians 2.9 and we don't continue on to 2.10. We say, well, we're saved by grace through faith. Not of anything that I do so that no man can boast. Read one more verse. It says we're created to do good works. We're called to pray when we pray, when we fast, when we give, when we serve, all that aspect of it. That's the fruit, the byproducts that we're talking about as well. So have you truly surrendered your life, make him king of kings? Have you made his house the priority? Because when you make his house the priority, everything else will fall in line. And then some of you are like, man, the church is bad. The church hurts me. I don't like this. I don't, I've been hurt by the church. This church has too much haze. This church doesn't have enough haze. They have too much lights. They don't have enough lights. They sing these songs. They don't sing those songs. Their pastor's in skinny jeans. Their pastor's fat and in a wheelchair. It doesn't matter. We put all these different things on it of why we don't like it. Luke 18. Now, he also told this parable of some people who trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and began praying this in regards to himself, God, I thank you, but I'm not like the other people, swindlers, crooked, adulterers, or even like the tax collector. I fast twice a week, I pay tithes of all that I get, but the tax collector standing some distance away was unwilling to raise his eyes towards heaven but was beating his chest saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other one. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Have you left your first love? Have you left your first love? Do you need to repent, start doing the deeds that you did at first? Do you need to start praying, start fasting, Start giving, start getting into the word, start praying, start soaking in him. Does that fire need to be rekindled back into you? Because once it does, the fruit's going to be there. The fruit's the byproduct of that. Amen? Stand to your feet, please. As we get ready to close, I'm going to invite Wes up here. So as we get ready to close, I invite the prayer team to come up front. I want to read you a story of another tree that bare good fruit. It's found in Luke 19, and if you don't really look at it, you could skip over this in this aspect. Jesus entered Jericho, was passing through, and there was a man called Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector. I'm going to sum it up a little bit. And he was trying to get after and see Jesus, but he couldn't. So he climbed up into this sycamore tree to see him. That sycamore tree is a fig. Jesus looked up there and said, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down, for today I must stay at your house. He hurried and came down and received him joyfully. When the people saw this, they all began to complain, saying he was gone to be with a guest of a man who is a sinner. But Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I'm given to the poor. And if I have extorted anything from anyone, I'm giving back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house. Because he too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Check it out. It's a sycamore. It's a sycamore fig. 
Jesus looks into it and sees good fruit. But it's the dirtiest fruit of them all. It's a chief tax collector. He's extorted people. He's ripped people off. He's taken money from people. But he repented. And he put his heart towards the Lord. And he changed his heart. And he's like, I want to give everything back. I just want to chase after you. And he told him, salvation's come to you. You see, like I said, you could be in here right now and you could be like, man, I'm struggling in some of these fruits of the Spirit. Jesus didn't curse the fig tree because it had just some of the, it's because it had none. So I encourage you to still repent from whatever it is you're struggling with. Whatever it is that you have, if you've got forgiveness issues in your heart, whatever it is, repent. Just as he, as the little Zacchaeus did. Put your focus back on the Lord. So you see, all are welcomed. We say that all are welcomed. But he's not going to leave you right where you're at. He loves you enough to welcome you and meet you right where you're at. But he loves you so much more that he's going to change and transform your life. From one step of glory to the next step of glory. So if you're in here today with every head bowed, all eyes closed. If you're in here today and you do not have a relationship with Jesus. I encourage you to be bold. Take a step of faith and come to the front. Meet with somebody. Pray with them and have them pray with you. Let them lead you and guide you and give you those next steps on what it is to truly surrender your life to the King of Kings. If you're in here today and you've left your first love, if you started focusing on your own house, doing your own things and let this world distract you, I encourage you to repent. Just as he told the church of Ephesus, repent. Turn from the ways that you were doing and start doing the deeds that you were. So as I pray, I encourage you to make...